Hello class. Uh, today we are going to low poly the coin we made previously. Uh, so if you want a quick refresher, you can go back to the previous episode. But last episode we essentially just made the high poly version of this uh, coin. Uh, it was a fun experience for all of us. Uh, I'll agree to to say that. But now this is the the fun part right we uh we're gonna take this high poly coin make a low poly from it cast normals bake information and then texture it inside of substance painter uh, i will take you through the unwrapping process it's a very simple object so it shouldn't take too long to unwrap i'll go over some theory when it comes to packing your normals or you know, packing your uvs and um using your uh, UV islands and UV atlas to get the most bang for your buck. All right, so let's, uh, let's dive in. All right, let's, uh, let's hide all of this stuff. All right, so here is our coin that we are going to low poly. And I know, guys, this is probably the hardest low poly we're ever going to have to do. That's perfectly fine. We're up to the challenge. We can do it. All right, so there's a few different methods when it comes to low poly, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So there is the idea that, well, I've got my model already. All I need to do really is kind of take off this turbo smooth and start working with something at this level. I would uh, take out this uh, this indent that I've that I've created here. Um, I I might leave this one in this ridge in, but I will definitely have to go in and take in take away some of these locking loops that I already have in here, right? Because we don't need all this extra geometry for our low poly. All right, so right now let's let's hit seven on our keyboard, and this shows us our statistics right here in the top left corner. You can see the statistics of your model, and right now our model is about uh, 500, uh, 500 and so polys. Let's turn it up. All right, so and whenever I turn on my turbo smooth, you can see that that number just jumps drastically. All right. So now we've got our model. This is the high poly. I'm just showing you how to uh, kind of analyze what's going on. All right. So let's make a duplicate of this to start our low poly. And yes, okay. I forgot to say the other part, the other way of doing it. The other way is we would just start over, create a cyl cylinder right on top of our low poly or our high poly. Like so, right? Make sure it matches. I can click this right here to align, right? That's my align tool. And it's going to pull up this dialog once I click on the object that I want it to align to. Then I'm just going to click center, center. And it's going to make sure that it's centered on uh, the X, Y, and Z positions, right? So I can hit OK, make sure it's centered. And then just go in here and then let's reduce our height so that it's just nice and flush with this. We'll actually just pull this guy up a little bit close like that. And then reduce this height so that it matches the silhouette of our uh, of our high poly. All right, and that's another thing we need to talk about is silhouette value, right? So you guys are going to start have to having to think through uh, the objects that you make in the sense that what matters the most whenever you're making something for video games is the silhouette value. It's something that if you haven't studied or you don't understand, you should probably look into. So I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about when I talk about silhouette value, all right? So here is our mannequin, right? But 
if you look at it from the side, let me make him do a pose, a recognizable pose. All right. So if you look at his outline, right, his outline is running, right? That's it's a very horrible run, but he's running. And this is his silhouette, the outline, right? The outline that makes up the shape of this guy is his silhouette. So, but if you do it like this, the silhouette doesn't read as well as if you have the silhouette like this. I can tell he's running a lot easier, right? Just based on that silhouette value, right? Because of what I can see, right? But if I turn it this way, that silhouette value gets a little bit lost, right? So when, you, when you're modeling stuff, when you're making your low poly, start looking at the silhouette value. And the easiest way to do that in uh, 3D is to open up your material editor, create a material that's completely black, right? So I'm just going to go in here. I'm going to change my uh, material color by grabbing this slider, dragging it all the way up, making it completely black. And then I can just assign that to my model, right? And now if I hold shift and drag out, I'm just going to make it a copy, hit OK, right? So now if we look at the silhouette value, right, this is the silhouette. It's round, right? We can't see any of the inner shape. The reason this is important is because it helps you read characters a lot better, right? You can read a character. You can tell from a silhouette that it's Mickey Mouse, right? If you look at a silhouette of Mickey Mouse, right, you can tell it's Mickey Mouse. So I'll just, just, right? And the beauty of silhouette value is if you do it right, it will sell your character from any angle, right? I didn't even have to put the nose. I didn't have to do anything other than draw two ears and that silhouette value reads, oh, that's Mickey Mouse, right? Because that's what your eye has trained to do. You've been trained by the artist, whoever makes Mickey Mouse, to see his silhouette and know, okay, that's Mickey Mouse, all right? So silhouette value is very important whenever we create anything. And we always, as artists, pay attention to what our silhouette looks like. Right. Another thing we pay attention to is our poly count. And the reason is because engines have different requirements for how many polys they can take. For our coin, we really don't have to worry about that in the sense that we don't want to make it like a billion polys for a coin. But, you know, we're not going to be because it's something relatively small. So I'm going to aim for 100 to 150, maybe at most 300 polys because I feel like I can do a lot with that, right? That's a lot of polygons. And the engine's gonna thank me for it later on because it's gonna be easier for it to handle that geometry. I can duplicate that a bunch of times and it won't really bog down my scene, all right? And whenever I'm making stuff, I always think, okay, how is it gonna look in a game? What is it gonna be used in a game? Is it gonna be a, a weapon? that's gonna be super close that you're you're standing right here. If this is like the reticle of a scope, imagine this is like the reticle of a scope. Is it a first person shooter? And you're, uh, you know, you're looking through a scope so you have to have something that's like this. So you might need a little more geometry or is it a coin and on your screen, this is how small it's gonna be. And from here, you can't tell the geometry hits, right? If you If you look close here, like if I'm zoomed in, right? This is what I talk about when I say geometry hits. I can look here and I can tell each individual polygon that this is made of. I can see it based on my silhouette value, right? I can see every single, like these vert, that's a vert right there, that's a vert right there, that's a vert, you know, I can see that. But if it's a coin on a table that's really far away, like imagine if it's in a, on a PS4, that, the asset might be that big. And can we tell those geometry hits from that far away? No, we can't. So we don't need to put in 100,000 polys for this coin, right? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you will find cases where people who are not as experienced will do stuff like that. I'm like, why, why did you put so many polys for something that you don't need it for? right? Take your polys, use them wisely, right? You're not going to be, there was a time when 
your whoever the director of the game or the, the, the producer would come to you and say, hey, here's our poly count. Here's our requirements, right? Make sure your characters fall under this, right? This is for optimal performance. You can have only so many meshes on a character, so many textures on a character, right? We've expanded that. We've gotten a lot better, but it's still good to have these practices in place so that we're not wasting polys. We're not just wasting polygons, right? I know you guys have probably seen the new Unreal Engine 5 and they're telling you, you don't need, you know, you don't even need to think about poly count anymore, but I'm here telling you, please still think about poly count. Please still optimize your work. Please still optimize your geometry because it just makes the production process so much smoother. In the very distant future, right, that might not be the case anymore. We might have evolved past that, but as, as of this moment, I still implore people, artists, to optimize their geometry. It just makes our world a lot better. Trust me, trust me. So let's move on to our low poly. All right. So in all honesty, if I'm being honest, I believe that this would probably cast the normals that we need. All right. Let's see how many polys I've got right now for this for this uh, object. OK, so right now what it's doing is it's showing me everything in the scene. And I don't want to see the poly count for everything in the scene. So I'm going to go into uh, my my this top hit that plus button and I'm going to go into configure viewports, right? It's going to pull up this dialog. And what I want to look for is I want to show my statistics. And in my statistics, these are, this is what your statistics is referring to, right? The stats of the scene where you've got 200 or so thousand polygons, so many tries, so many verts, right? And in video games, it's important to look more at the triangle count than the polygon count. The reason is because... Whenever you get into a video game engine, it's going to turn everything into tries anyway. So it's important for you to look at the triangle count to know what your actual triangle count is because essentially a square, right? A polygon is just two triangles. Let me show you what I'm talking about. All right. I'm going to make a plane. This is a polygon. This face right here is a polygonal face. Let's convert it to an editable poly. And if I grab this edge and this edge, hit F4 to see our edges, and I connect them. Let's hit connect. Right? A polygon is literally just made up of two triangles. Your video game engine is going to do just that. What it's going to do is it's going to take all your polys. It's going to start slicing them bad boys up, right? So a lot of artists go in themselves and turn their polys to make sure that it's facing the orientation that you want it to. Because what happens is whenever you shade inside of engines, it's shading your objects and, and casting your shadows and lighting not based on your polygons, but based on your vertices. And if your vertices is turned in a certain, in a different direction, it might affect the way it's shading. All right, so that's something that you have to keep in mind whenever you're making your objects. All right, so now we've got our low poly. Let's continue on to, uh, to finalize our low poly. All right, so right now I've got, I've got a pretty decent start. I might increase the radius just a smidge just a smidge so you know the best result you're going to get is going to be if this is intersecting about halfway through like you know you want a, a mix of it's intersecting and it's not intersecting you don't want it to be like uh like that and you don't want it to be too far inside you want it to be just in the center an average of your high poly right that's what you want for your low poly the average of this high poly, all right? So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna make this ridge. There's a ridge right here, and if I don't put it in, it's gonna be very hard for my low poly to capture that uh, that interior, this this edge right here. So it's, so this edge right here. 
The reason is because normal maps don't really like 90 degree angles very well, and they don't bake them uh, very well. So it's always best to have some sort of 45 degree angle uh, at worst, uh, or at best, I guess I'll say, to, to kind of help the information travel, right? I've got this nice bevel, this beautiful bevel that we made here, and I want that to translate. And if I have a 90 degree angle, it's the, the computer engine, the baking engine, right, in substance is going to have a hard time translating this onto a 90 degree uh, angle. So what I'm going to do is, let's do, let's right click this, convert this to an editable poly. Actually, before I do that, instead of 18, let's just make it 20. All right. And I still can't see my polys right now, so let's go into, let's configure our viewport again. And in my statistics, I'm going to show the total and the selection. I'm going to also check my triangle count. I'm going to apply it to this viewport. I can close it out, right? Now my selection is going to show. So whenever I select something, it's going to say, whatever object you have, the selection is this many polys, this many tries, this many verts. All right, let me delete this guy. All right, I've got a decent average going here. Let's select this. How many polys do we have right now? We've got 80 polys. Wow, big spender, big spender. That's that's who I am. I'm a big spender. I'm gonna spend my polys wisely. So now let's just convert this to an editable poly. Uh, let's see. Now, I'm going to grab these guys. I'm just going to do a an inset just a little bit, just to give me something right there. And then I'm going to hit 2 on my keyboard to go into my edge mode. Hit F4 so I can see my wireframe. Right? I can see my wireframe and what's going on. And I can just double click on this edge right here. Double click the edge and then I'm going to hit a chamfer on it. So just throw a chamfer on that bad boy. All right. So now we've got a chamfer on it. All right. And this is some sometimes the problem that I run into whenever you're recreating it uh, from scratch. All right. You can run into some issues like this where it's not matching up perfectly so you're going to get some issues with that and that's why I like to go the route of just kind of starting with a, the base itself so that's why I never usually collapse this stuff too is because now I can just I'm going to turn off my turbo smooth and I'm going to go to my uh, let's see is it tool let me make a clone let's do tools Edit, yeah, clone. All right, control V, and I'm gonna make it a copy this time. I'm gonna make it a copy, not an instance, because I'm gonna edit it. All right, so now we've got a copy on top of a copy. All right, so this poly, this is about 500 polys, about 1100 tries, and uh, 500 or so, 550 verts or so. All right, so I'm just going to hit Alt and Q, and this isolates it. So now I'm just working with what I will call my coin low poly. All right, my coin low poly. I've got that going for me. And let me see what happens if I just go down the list. No, no. All right. I'm going to right click it, convert it to an editable poly, and that is perfectly fine. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is actually could just go back one. I want to turn off this symmetry, go under this stack, right? I, I control Z to get back to this point right here. So I just hit control and Z. Now that I'm back at this point, what I'm going to do is now. I'm going to go in my edge mode. And I'm just going to start taking away some of this stuff. So like now I'm going to loop it, control and backspace, control and backspace will remove that for me. All right, now I'm going to do the same to this. I don't even want to deal with 
this indent because I don't need it. I'm not, I think my normals will cast just fine. I'm just going to control click. If I control click, I can select multiple. And then I'm just going to hit the grow key, the grow button right here. I'm just going to grow, 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 grow. Right? We've grown it all the way out. We're almost to this edge. We need to grow one more time. And I'm going to just hit delete. Right? I've deleted that edge. And I'm going to select, delete, deleted those faces. I'm going to select this inner border right here. Hit R on my keyboard. And then just squeeze them in. I'm gonna squeeze them in, squeeze them in, squeeze them in, squeeze them in. Well, this is fine and all, but instead, let's just delete the whole thing. Boom, done. Look at that. Easy. And then I'm gonna go to my front view. I'm gonna hold down Shift and then do the same, same function. All right, I'm going to hold down control and then select my verts, right click, and then weld. So now if you see my weld options before, it was 144. Now we're at 135. All right. So the rule of thumb is, if anything is uh, smaller, if you have something smaller than the size of a quarter, right the a quarter like that it's very thin then the normal match the normal map will catch it but if it's bigger than a quarter the indent or whatever then you're going to want to use uh geometry to define that edge or the shape or whatever it is you're trying to trying to define and i feel like this is this is probably a little bigger than a quarter so I'll let I'll let this ridge live. And the next thing I'll do is I'll actually make two separate ones. I'll make this one, which will be like our mid poly. And then I'll make one, which is our like our lowest poly, which will kind of explain LODs as well, which is stands for level of detail. If you've never heard that term before, LOD stands for level of detail. And the quick explanation is whenever you're playing a video game and you see that uh, whenever you like drop in that things are starting to pop in and you see like a lower version of a of an object and then when you get close to it it pops in a much more uh, nicely detailed or a better resolution of that same object what's happening is they're switching out lower geometry when you're far away for higher geometry when you're close up so that it helps performance and it helps your draw calls and things like that. It'll make for a smoother experience. And that's why whenever you're flying over like in GTA or something, you'll see buildings and stuff start to pop up. Well, those are your LODs in action. They're replacing lower resolution objects for higher resolution objects. So I'm going to make two different versions. I'm going to make a, a smaller uh, LOD version, and then I'm going to make a mid poly just to kind of show you the difference. And you're going to see the differences negligible at best right because normal maps do so much normal maps are they just they save a lot of lives because the stuff that we can't put in the high poly goes all into the normal map all that detail and stuff bakes right into the normal map and convinces our eyes and tricks our eyes into believing that this object has way more detail than it actually does all right, so let's move on. So now we've got our uh, our, our uh, coin welded and, and good to go. And I can just hit two on the keyboard. I'm just gonna control backspace this. I don't need that, that center line. So now we've got something a whole lot cleaner. And now we can just throw back on our, our uh, symmetry modifier. Let's go in here, let's grab this, this border. And grab the back and then just, just turn on our symmetry again and now we've got a symmetrical uh, coin that is good to go all right 
and I'm gonna cut this turbo smooth off because this is our low poly. Right, if I right click and convert it to an editable poly, it'll now tell me, oh wow, I've got a magical 200 polygons. And I'm gonna take away this one as well, control backspace that, that line right there. This is gonna save us a few more polys as well. So now we're down to 214 and I feel like this is still way too much, right? 200, that's overkill. Right, I, I, this is still overkill for me, but for teaching purposes, this will be just fine. Well, I hit F4 to remove the wireframe so I can see what's going on. All right, so the next thing I want to address now are what we call smoothing groups. What smoothing groups are, are, <laughs> what smoothing groups are, are, are things that allow us to smooth our objects. That's the, the most layman way that I can explain it without going into anything crazy technical, right? So I will select, so if I hold down shift, select this guy, this has its own smoothing group. The smoothing group allows us to tell the transition. So like you can tell that this transition is going on right there, and then this is going on right there, and then this is going on right here. So there's a bunch of different smoothing groups going on that's affecting our object right now. I'll show you what it looks like when I take all of them off so that you guys understand what the smoothing groups are doing. I'm gonna take all my smoothing groups off. Right, I'm just gonna go down here to where it says polygon smoothing groups. I'm gonna hit clear. So if I clear it, every single one of these has its own smoothing groups, every single one. So this, this polygon has its own smoothing group. This polygon has its own smoothing group. This, 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 everything. That's why it looks so faceted right now, right? To change that and to get something a little, uh, a little easier or a little better for us to, uh, to work with whenever we, when it comes time to bake stuff, is just to add a single smoothing group. You won't understand why this is gonna work a lot better for you, but this is gonna work a lot better for you when it comes to your low poly than uh, the other way around. Sometimes I might just add a smoothing group here. So I might just add another one right there. And then you'll have like a line that, but no, nah, I, don't, I don't want that. All right, so this is good, and we are good to go whenever it comes to our low poly uh, mesh, all right? So we've got our low poly. The next step for us to do is now to unwrap this, all right? And before I unwrap it, I like to do a few steps to make sure I'm working with the cleanest possible low poly that I can possibly have. And whenever I open up my UV editor, I'm not dealing with a bunch of random missing parts and stuff like that because we've been making a lot of edits to this and it hasn't been respecting the UVs so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my uh, my utilities panel and then I'm just going to reset the X forms on this. Right? I'm going to reset the selected, make sure that's good, right click it and just convert it to an editable poly right I've reset my X forms that is good to go the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my modifier list I'm gonna type in UV map clear UV map clear right there select that and what it's gonna do is it's gonna clear all of the UVs all the previous UVs because it comes with its own UVs and I'm gonna right now I'm gonna create my own and I don't want to work with any pre-built UVs I want it to be as base as possible so I'm gonna add my UV mapping clear right click on it and convert it to an editable poly right we've got our editable poly it's looking good right now the next step is to add a UV unwrap UVW unwrap UVW right here Click that unwrap UVW. Hopefully this doesn't crash. Oh, no crash. All right. We got our unwrap UVW on and nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. That's because you don't have your UV editor open. So you're going to go into the edit UVs section, click on the open UV editor. And now I have my UV editor monitor. Right? And I like to kind of put it off to the side a little bit so I can see my model and work on my UV uh, island as well. Right? So this square right here, this is called an island. This is your UV island and you've got these checker patterns that show you how everything is working. I can just select the whole thing 
and then hit reset and it'll reset everything for me all right so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select these polygons actually like everything in 3ds max there's a bunch of different ways to do stuff so I'm going to select my edge I'm going to select this edge right here double click it and then I'm going to right click in my window here in my UV editor window and I'm going to break and what that does is it splits this entire loop from the rest of the object. I'm going to do the same for the other side. I'm going to right click in here. And I'm going to hit break. And then I'm going to go into my, my polygon selection tool. And then I'm going to select this guy, move it out of the way. All right, it's just up here. It's not, it's not disappeared or anything. I'm just going to move that guy out of the way. I'm going to select this guy. And then I'm just going to scroll down. And then I'm going to reset the peel on it. And what it's going to do is it's going to reset it back to its origin. I want it to be flat. So think of it like if you wanted to make a box or if you unravel the box, right? You have a box that you have and you want to unravel it, right? The way you unravel it so you can paint it, that's essentially what you're doing for these objects. You're unraveling your pre-made model and then you're going to go into maybe Photoshop, Substance Painter, Mari, whatever software you're going to use and you're going to texture it in there, all right? So for you guys who already know how to do all this stuff, you guys can definitely skip to the substance painter part of this to, to learn what I'm doing there. But if you don't know how to unwrap, this is just a basic uh, kind of tutorial. And there are videos out in, on YouTube in the world that shows you very, very in-depth ways to unwrap. But this object is so simple that, I mean, in, in two to three minutes, you can have the entire thing unwrapped. All right. So now we've got our two uh, two shapes to the front and the back, front and back, front and back, front and back. All right. So now I'm going to select this middle band area, and then I'm going to add this projection modifier on it, the cylindrical uh, projection modifier. And what it's going to do is it's going to project a cylinder on top of it that's going to help us unwrap the object. And right now our cylinder that it's is oriented in the wrong direction. So we need to find the orientation that this is in. So it's not in X, it's not in Z, it is in Y, all right? So now that it's in Y, it's gonna unwrap it the way that it's supposed to be. And I'm gonna hit fit, make sure that it fits, all right? So now I can select it, and I'm just gonna scale it down a little bit. I'm just gonna scale it down so it matches. What I want to do is I want to match this square as much as possible, as much as I possibly can, match the exact same shape so that when I'm painting on it, I'm painting very accurate. And if I can't see that, there's two ways that unwrapping helps you in that. If you see this little checkbox right here, this little box, this little drop down menu, you can drop it down and then you can figure out, you can click on one of these two to check out the checker map. All right, let's do this texture checker map. And this is going to say, okay, here's the checker pattern and here are some letters. I like to use letters and the checkers because it helps me know how lettering will look if I have to write something on it, if I have to do decals or something like that, if it's going to squash and stretch my text. And I don't want anything squashed. I want my C's to look like C's and not oblonged or, or squares or something. So you might get something like this where you know that's completely wrong and whenever you try to texture it, it's going to texture wrong. So you want something that looks just like this, right? Where you've got a, almost like a one-to-one -one ratio of everything. Everything's looking right, good, and ready to go. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is right here. It might go to my top view, look at this. And this looks a little squished. So I'm just going to go in here and then start start manipulating it so that my O's or my circles look like circles and my squares look like squares, right? You want your squares to be square, your circles to be circles. All right. Now we are good to go. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pack 
my UV. So I want to pack all these objects into this UV island. Because if I leave it like this, the only thing I'll be allowed to paint on is anything that's confined within this space, right? We're not using UDIMs right now, which is another topic for another day. It's having multiple UV islands to texture our, uh, our object. And that's only used in uh, very high budget movies and cutscenes and stuff like that so that you can have as much texture resolution in one single object as you possibly can all right because that's that's if like i'm about to be zooming in like right here i'm going to be zooming in right here and i want as much texture detail as much resolution as possible i would use udims but we're not doing that so we're just going to select all of our objects and then we're going to pack and normalize what packing and normalizing does is it normalizes each object to each other and you shouldn't use the same word to define it so I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that this object in ratio in comparison to this is its normal size. It's the like the ratio, the one to one ratio for it is is actually correct. So this size and this size are will match each other. Right. So you can see this G and this H are going to be relative to the same size. All right, so here's something that you're going to run into that's going to be an issue. All right, let's turn, throw in the checker pattern. So I'm making sure everything is squares, everything's laid out nicely. All right, so we've got so much space here, and we want to use as much of our island as possible because this is all wasted space. If we were making a bunch of different things, a bunch of, we can jam pack this stuff filled with objects but we don't have that luxury we've only got this so what i will do is i'm just going to increase them i'm just going to scale it up till they meet the edge and i i'm using as much of this texture resolution as i possibly as i possibly can and i can like scale this but what you'll tell is these squares right here are now smaller than these squares so my texture resolution is different right the amount of resolution that this contains is way more than this contains because this occupies only this much space so if i wanted to rectify that i could select this one maybe let's see let's, let's break this guy in half let's break this guy right in half so if i break this guy in half I can right click and break this guy. So now I can, oh crap, I missed a piece. That's real crap, that's real crap. So let's, uh, let's break this off and then I can just stack this at the bottom and then I can do the same thing in the sense of just scale it up so now we're having better resolution for the both of them, all right? So now, if I select this guy, I'm just going to move this guy up. So I'm trying to maximize as much texture resolution as I possibly can. All right, that's the name of the game, texture resolution. Now, I've got this guy in here, this guy like so. Where's this guy? Let's do Normalize again. All right. Okay, so now we have essentially unwrapped our object. Now we are, let me close this out and then convert it to an editable poly. Is it F4? Because I feel like I'm missing some edges. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. I've got these extra edges here. I'm just going to double click, control backspace. This is going to reduce our poly count even more, which is awesome. Let's reduce our poly count even more. Perfect. All right, so now let's see what our final poly count is. Seven on the keyboard. We are at 142 polys, 284 tries.
Beautiful stuff. All right. And I still think that would be overkill. For a coin, if you're going past 50, for real, for real, in like production, you're you're wasting time. But this is a this is a teaching thing, so I want to give you guys the most bang out of your buck. Alright. So now we've got our coin low polyed. The next thing we're gonna do is let's unhide all. Let's unhide all. I've got certain things hidden right now. Say Alt Q. Say W. All right. So that's. Let's, let's do M. I'm gonna do M and go to my material editor and add a high poly color. I'm just gonna make the high poly blue. Low poly green. Okay, so let's turn on the turbo smooth. Let's do three. So we're probably going to end up with something like this, which is about 71,000 polys. And we're going to cast all of this lovely information from here. We're going to cast all of this information from here to here. So our low poly is 142. This is our final result, guys. Like, so this is it this is where it's at all right now let's open up substance painter and pick up right there okay so the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to export these and to export them before i export them i want to put this guy right back on top of this guy right because what we're going to do is we're going to cast these normals so I've placed it right on it, and you can tell that they're they fit so snugly. They're perfectly together, right? Perfectly together. All right. So I'm gonna select my high poly. I'm gonna right click on it, and I'm gonna convert it to an editable poly because if I leave this layer stack on and I try to export it and bake it out in another piece of software, um, what's gonna happen is it's not going to read any of that information. That stack is only uh, read by 3ds Max. And if we take it to another piece of software, the software isn't going to know that you added a symmetry, added poly, symmetry. It doesn't know any of that. So what you want to do is you want to collapse all of that information in so you're dealing with just that high poly. And right now we've got 175. I'm going to make it like four because we can... We can really crank this bad boy. We got 200,000. We're going to convert that bad boy to an editable poly, and we should be good. Now I'm going to go into my file, and then we're going to hit export selected. All right, so we're going to go into my coin model. And in my coin model, I'm going to make a new folder. I love making new folders, y'all. I'm going to call these exports, right? I want my things in certain places so whenever I go back to look for them, easy to find. Professionally, what I do is I have a template folder that I make that I use for everything, right? I just have a template. I drag it and drop it inside, and I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about recreating the folder structure or trying to remember how I label things and stuff like that. I have it pre-made. It's called 000.template. And I just drag and drop it and I work from that folder. All right. And I would suggest you guys do the exact same thing. So my exports, let's export our coin underscore high poly. FBX is perfectly fine. Hit save. You might have an issue with the material or something, but that is okay. All right, you're going to be faced with this dialog right here. We're just going to hit OK, and we might run into a material error. Well, that's exactly what we ran into, and that's okay because it has a hard time trying to export uh, physical materials. That's, I, that's fine with me. I don't care. 
That's not what we care about. We care about the data, and that's pretty much it. All right. So the next thing we're going to export is our low poly. We're going to do file, export selected, and then we're going to do low poly. Low poly. And we're going to say save. It's probably going to give us the same warning. We're going to move on right past it. Just hit OK. All right. So now we've exported both of our uh, our objects, and now we're going to move into Substance Painter. Substance Painter. All right. So here is Substance Painter. All right, your default Substance Painter might look different. Your shelf might be at the bottom, but this is how I like mine configured. I like my object to be nice and in the middle, everything else on the side. This is my personal setup. Uh, you can set it up however you want. You can undock all of this stuff and dock it back wherever you want. All right, like I can put my shelf up there, right side. Like I can do whatever I want, but this is just the most comfortable for me. If yours doesn't look like this, uh, you probably have the default setup, and you can probably set it up back to the default setup, right? You can you can change the defaults back, all right? So now, let's start by just going to File, and we're going to do New, and we're going to do PBR Metallic Roughness, all right? This is perfectly fine. PBR Metallic Roughness is what uh, most engines use. Unreal uses it. Uh, Unity uses uh, the specular uh, roughness, specular glossiness workflow, and that's more of a Unity thing, but we're going to use PBR metallic roughness because I'm going to imagine that Unreal is our uh, final destination. And the funny, the, the beauty, not the funny, the beauty about uh, Substance Painter is you can change that on the fly. You can change that at the end of the project and determine whatever kind of uh, engine it's going into and it'll pack your materials or your textures the, the appropriate way. Our document resolution, I'll do 2048. This is fine. And where it says um, where it says select, we're going to select our file. And what we're going to just do is we're going to navigate to our, uh, our point model. And in our exports, we're going to navigate to our low poly. We're going to open up our low poly model, uh, hit OK. And it should bring in our low poly model and our UVs. So if you don't see your UVs, so I just hit F1 on my keyboard and it brings up my model and my UV. So you get a side by side of what they look like. I don't need to see my UVs. I got, you know, I, I know what I'm doing, but you guys might want to see it to see what's going on. So I'm just going to hit F2 to go back into my coin. So I'm just looking at my coin model itself. The next thing on the list is to go into our texture settings, right? And we're going to try to bake our material. We're going to try to bake our uh, normal map, our ambient occlusion, uh, maybe a color ID map. Oh, we don't need a color ID, but what well, ambient occlusion, thick, all the other stuff, all the good stuff. We're going to bake all that stuff in right now. All right, so we're, we're going to go into our uh, bake mesh map settings and the mesh maps, right? And then here, right, this dialog button right here, it's going to ask you, where do you want to have your high definition mesh? I can use my low poly mesh to cast this stuff, but that's if I'm doing like really low poly stuff where I'm actually painting all of this information, right? That's when I would use my low poly as my high poly mesh because I don't have a high poly mesh. I'm just using my low poly to cast that information. But I do have a high poly mesh, and if I click on this little piece of paper thing right here, it's going to navigate to where my folder is, and then I can select my high poly mesh, hit open, and now my high poly mesh is right here, ready to go. My uh, cage distance is fine, the default, we're going to try that for now. I'm going to set up my anti-aliasing settings to about uh, 4 by 4 and the reason I go four by four is because the moment I start going eight by eight and you know and going up there, it's gonna start adding to the render times for this stuff. And the way I like to explain it is, 
the the there's there's a law kind of of diminishing returns. So after four by four, uh, you know, subsampling, you're really like what you're really getting for your buck, right? It's it's not worth it sometimes because you might have a crazy mesh, and it could be the difference between waiting for like an hour to render out your your object or twenty minutes, right? And on production, like right, when I was in the studio, I would usually just go four by four over eight by eight because I don't want to wait two hours to render something that I would get similar results at four by four. If I need eight by eight, it'd be something for like a cut scene or something where you're super close and we'll have time. But if you're on a you know tight schedule and you've got a bunch of stuff that you need to knock out, I mean, four by four will get you right where you need to go. All right. So uh, do I want it to match? Yes, it's going to match always. Uh, I can use these suffixes if I have multiple objects. I can use these suffixes to determine which my low poly object is and my high poly object is. And it'll say, okay, match this low poly to this high poly. So I can have like arm low poly, right, low, uh, you know, um, uh, left arm low poly or low. And then it'll it'll match those and it'll bake just those on top of each other and you won't have uh, some some you know uh, casting creeps and stuff like that going on. All right, so this is fine. This is good to go. My world space normal. There are no parameters in here. I don't need material IDs, so I'm just going to uncheck that, right? I don't need material IDs. I usually make material IDs if I'm making like multiple objects or I want to separate things. If I've got like metal, wood, rubber, right? I would put a different color on those things just so that I have easier control whenever I'm, I'm creating my textures and stuff like that. Ambient occlusion. Uh, instead of cone, uh, cosine, I usually use uniform. I usually like the uniform, the results a little better. Um, let's see, self occlusion, that's fine. Uh, let's see, now we can go into our curvature. Uh, this is fine. Position is fine. Thickness, I mean, it's a metal coin. It doesn't need a thickness map. Right, that's if I if I was making skin or fruits or something like that. The thickness map tells you, okay, this part of the mesh is thin, this part of the mesh is thick, so it's not as opaque. You can use this for like subsurface scattering and stuff like that. So I'm, right now, I feel like I'm I'm packing so much information into you guys, but this stuff, the more you do it, right, the better you're gonna get. The more you're gonna understand what's going on under the hood. All right, so. Now we're good to go. Oh, actually, we're not good to go. Our bake output size right now is 512. This isn't the resolution size for the document that we set up in the beginning. This is actually what it's going to bake out for us. And we don't want 512. 512 is a very, very tiny little map, right? And it, it's tiny, but a lot of people make it do. What I'm going to use is 2048. And we're going to bake it and see what happens. All right, let's bake it up. All right, you can see what's going on. It's going through the motions, baking out all of our info for us. All right, you can see it work. Good stuff, good stuff. I don't have any errors or anything yet, so I'm good to go. Okay, all right. And just like that, we have our coin. All right, and if you look at my wireframe, If you look at the wireframe, let's look at our wires. Let's look at the wires. All right, let's look at our wires. It's still that low poly. All we did was cast that information onto it. We just casted all of that fun high poly detail onto that. All right. So this is what our our UVs would look like. This is what our UVs look like. So now we can get to painting. All right. So now we've baked all of our fun stuff. Now let's throw some let's throw some materials on there. Let's see what it looks like. Let's see. I want to see if I can find like a dirty gold. I want to look like make it look like a dirty gold coin. And there's a bunch of presets in here that you can use. And that's what I'm going to just start with. I'm just going to start with this preset. And just like that, we have our coin. 
And if I hold down Shift and right click, I can get that. So there's an issue that I'm seeing right now that I don't really like. If you look in here, it doesn't look as deep as our high poly. And that has to do with whenever we baked our max frontal and rear distance. And what this says is, how far do you want me to shoot the rays? Because whenever it bakes, what happens is the engine is shooting out a bunch of light rays at our object and those light rays are bouncing back and it's going okay this is this deep this information is this deep let me send that back and it's going to render that into your information so our max frontal and distance isn't far enough to capture the depth of this coin so we might need to mess with either the rear distance or the the frontal distance to really get that going so let's bake this and see if we get something a little deeper. All right, see, it's getting a little bit deeper after I, after I uh, mess with my rear distance, right? You can see that it's clipping, right? It's clipping right there because our distance isn't going far enough. So I'm, I might need to, to go a little further in on my, uh, my max rear distance. Let's just drag this out and see what we get. All right, let's see. And we are not, it doesn't look like we're getting any clipping. Nope, no clipping whatsoever. Perfect. All right, so now this is accurate. This is what it's supposed to look like. There we go. Nice. All right. So now we've got our coin that looks just like our high poly with a tenth of the amount of polygons that that, that had. All right. And you can still see these geometry hits whenever you get up close. But if you think about a coin, right, the moment you get right here, I can't even tell what, you know, those geometry hits anymore. And this is how big you're going to see it on the screen. Imagine like the Mario game. The Mario game is probably like this, probably like this big, right? That you're, you know, if it's spinning or something, and it's right here. You got to bounce and get it, right? Like it's that big. So we don't really need it to be crazy resolution. Right, the amount of resolution we put in is already uh, is already enough, and this is uh, this is going to be a I call this a success. This is what we want right here. All right, so now let's let's take off this material and let me let me just because um, it's easy to just drag and drop and you know think that you're doing something, but uh, the mark of somebody who's a badass is somebody who can create their materials from scratch. So to do that, we're going to go into our property settings. We're going to add, let's add a new fill layer. I, I just added a new fill layer. And if I scroll down, I can find the, uh, the base color here. And I can change it to like my gold, whatever I, I, you know, my gold color. All right, so I've got my color, my height, my roughness, my metal, and my normal, right, all checked. So every one of these options is checked. So if I increase my height, that would increase the height map and stuff like that. So my roughness, this is very important. This is very important right here. This determines the the roughness of the surface, how smooth the surface is, right? This is a completely matte, opaque surface if you take it all the way to white. But if you make it black, it gives you something completely reflective, all right? So the next one I'm gonna mess with is my metallic. Right now, it's not metallic, but as soon as I start hitting that slider, boom, we've got ourselves a very, very reflective metal. Right, I just made my own gold metal material from scratch. Right, so this is like just like the basic of the basics, right? Here. I'm just doing the basic of the basics. All right, so let's add a little more fun to this. Let's, just, let's go a little, let's, let's add a smart mask. All right, I'm going to add a new fill layer. And this fill layer 
Uh, let's call it like, like, let's make it our grunge or our dirt kind of thing. So let's make it like the color of dirt. Let's get something a little more brown. All right. And we'll make it. All right. We can throw that on there. And I feel like my gold is stupid shiny. It's way too shiny. So let's reduce the roughness. All right, so we get something closer to that. So it's no, it's actually reduce the roughness. So it's not the world's shiniest gold coin. All right, so I think let's do just a little bit more. Just just a just a, just a teensy bit more. I want it to be shiny, but I don't want it to reflect the universe. All right, I want more blurred reflections. I'm adding some of this dirt and in, in the cavities and stuff like that. And then I can mess with my mask editor here and just start dialing in this information, right? As much as I want that, that grunge to be. So I'm just going to reduce that. So I'm getting a little more coverage, a little. So now it's not as, as brand new a coin as we originally had, right? Okay, let's add a little bit of dust. I'm gonna add some dust to the surface as well. I'm gonna add a new fill layer. And these are just like the basics of the basics right here that I'm showing you guys. And and once you guys start getting the hang of this, I'm telling you, you guys are gonna have so much fun doing this kind of stuff because you're just experimenting. You're having fun, you're doing your thing. And uh, you know, it, it's a really fun thing to do. So let's find some dust. Let's see, we got dirty ground. Do, 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 do. Let's, let's try this dry dust. Let's see what that looks like. Ooh, I like that. Looks cool. All right. Yeah, looks cool. And then in my mask editor, I can go in my mask editor once again, right? And then just start dialing these bad boys back. Reduce my global balance. I don't want it to be too crazy. I want some dust. All right, so that's going to be it for this. Uh, let's, let's. All right, guys, so I just wanted to give you guys a quick recap of what we have gotten done here today. Okay, so we uh, went in 3ds Max and we made ourselves a low poly from the high poly model that we've created. And then we took our low poly and high poly into Substance Painter, baked out our normal maps, our ambient occlusion, and created custom textures for their display, which is really, really fun. And here is our final result. All right, so let's see. So here is our final coin in all its glory. I want to thank you for watching this episode. Let me know if you have any questions or comments below. If there's anything you'd like me to cover that I didn't really cover or go over too well, let me know in the comment section. Uh, feel free to reach out. Don't, don't be shy. I'm generally nice. Generally. Joking. But uh, this was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, have a good day.